Welcome to part two of our discussions in public international law. And this second part is uh, the topic is the subjects of international law. So first off, we will now make a distinction. A distinction between a subject and object of international law. So when we say a subject of international law, a subject is an entity that has rights and responsibilities under international law. It can be a proper party in transactions involving the application of the law of nations among members of the international community. An object, on the other hand, is a person or a thing in respect of which rights are held and obligations assumed by the subject. It is not directly governed by the rules of international law, its rights are received and its responsibilities imposed indirectly through the instrumentality of an international agency. By this distinction, we find that a subject has a legal standing or a, uh, a legal personality which is recognized by the international community, which is, of course, not available to an object. In order for an object to have legal standing in the international community, it must act through what we call an instrumentality of an international agency. And most of the times, this agent is usually, or not usually, but rather a subject of international law. And if it is with regards to persons, then it is usually uh, the state which would represent a person in the international community in order to have a standing or a legal capacity to uh, to be recognized in the in this international community so what is the significance of being a subject of international law. In 1949, the International Court of Justice famously remarked that to be an international person, an entity must be a subject of international law and capable of possessing international rights and duties. It must also have the capacity to maintain its rights and duties by bringing international claims. And therefore, by that uh, remark, we can say that a subject has an is an international person has a a uh, an international um, personality and therefore it has the capacity to maintain its rights and duties by bringing international claims and as I mentioned, this is not, of course, available to an object of international law, which can only bring and maintain claims and uh, uh, or can only bring claims to the international into inter the international attention through a subject. And usually, as I mentioned, it is usually a state or a uh, an international organization. What then are the subjects of international law? Primarily, it is states which are the subjects of international law. But there are non-state actors such as international organizations, non-governmental organizations, groups, and some, in certain instances, individuals. We have corporations and certain other anomalous entities. As has always been the case in international law, it is only states that have international legal personality to the fullest extent. They are the most obvious and universally accepted subjects of international law. The non-state actors, by this particular definition, we can say that they do not enjoy full international legal personality. It is only the state which 
uh, has an international legal personality in its fullest extent. Well, in our mind, I think we know what states are. Usually, uh, the states are countries or nations, no? uh, which, for example, the Philippines, the Japan, China, the United States, Russia, these are states. But what constitute the state? What makes a state a state? There are four traditional criteria for statehood. These are a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and the capacity to enter relations with other states. A permanent population necessarily entails that, uh, entails that the population is sufficient in number so that they can continue to procreate and to, and sufficient enough to uh, be able to defend their territory, the territory of the state. Now, a territory, a defined territory, is a part of the surface of the earth over which a state exercises jurisdiction and sovereignty. And a state would, of course, need a government, which and which government has the capacity to enter into relations with other states. So the government and the capacity to enter into relations with other states are uh, intertwined because a state or a government uh, which does not have the capacity to enter into relations with other states we can consider is under, uh, does not exercise sovereignty. It is it negates the existence of of sovereignty in in a in a uh, in a government. It might be under the influence of another state because it acts under um, the direction or under the control of a another state, and therefore it would not fall under the, a category of a state. These are such as in situations of uh, colonies, okay, which are, of course, you know, under a, a mother uh, or an empire, you know, which controls this particular colony. As I mentioned, the, the, those were the previously, you no, know, the traditional. Um, requisites for statehood. But some argue that, well, there are other conditions that require, that, that are required in order for a state to be considered a state. And some argue that recognition is a, an important um, criteria for a state to become a state because unless an entity is accorded recognition as a state by a sufficiently large number of other states, it cannot realistically claim to be a state with all the corresponding rights and obligations. And therefore, the argument is that if it is not recognized, if a certain uh, territory, which is a government and has a population, and uh, it may have the ability to interact or to um, to interact with uh, other states. Uh, this is negated when other states does not recognize that particular that particular state or that particular entity. So participation in international organizations and regional groupings is also of considerable importance in the assertion of legal capacity and will often flow from a broader recognition. Again, the argument is that in order for a state to be considered a state, there must be a recognition of that particular state by, of course, by other states.
Some even argue that an, another criteria is the willingness of this state to comply with its obligations under international law. Its willingness to comply with international law. As I mentioned, no, there are arguments as to whether recognition is a, a requisite, and there are two sides of this argument. The declaratory theory of recognition treats recognition as a mere political or symbolic act with no legal ramifications. Now, this means that if the entity has the four uh, requisites of statehood, then there is no necessity for recognition. The existence itself, the, the presence of the the uh, four requisites already now uh, creates the state. However, under the constitutive theory, recognition by existing states is a fundamental precondition for the attainment of statehood for a newly emerging state. Statehood as a legal status springs from the act of recognition itself. So those are the two conflicting theories of recognition. One says that recognition is merely a, a political or symbolic act. The other me says that it is a precondition for statehood. But now, uh, yeah, the application of this, no, the, the argument is that in the states that were created, no, for example, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, Croatia. Now, these these particular states arose, or these particular territories arose from uh, a civil strife in 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 uh, these territories came from the breakup of the former. Uh, Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia are some of the six constituent republics in that particular state. Now, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, when Yugoslavia uh, broke from the broke away from the Soviet Union, uh, there was a war. No. A war of independence, or war, uh, there was a civil war. No, it's a combination of, of ethnic cleansing, a civil war, and, and uh, war of independence that broke the former or bigger state into several uh, smaller uh, territories. Now, the problem was, of course, now which among these states succeeded to the uh, responsibilities and the rights of the uh, former Yugoslavia. And uh, are these states or are these um, territories considered states? No. Well, uh, that is where the question of recognition comes in. So unless and until at that a time when other states and other nations recognized these particular smaller republics that these were these were given the status of statehood what then is recognition actually well it is actually political recognition when we say political recognition it occurs where a recognizing state or government expresses a willingness to enter into political and other relations with the recognized state or government. And with the recognition of a state, it acquires a standing in the international community. Because remember, a, a, the international community, again, no, consists of other states. If it is recognized by a state, 
that it is a state, then it acquires the status of a state. And therefore, it would enjoy uh, whatever rights and whatever benefits and recognitions that the state has in this particular international community. As I have pre previously mentioned, there are non-state subjects of international law. And one of these is or are international organizations like the League of Nations and the United Nations. So from a legal perspective, international organizations are entities by states as a vehicle to further their common interests. So it arises no, from agreements between and among states. They are constituted by treaty and are usually composed of three organs, a plenary assembly of all member states, an executive organ with limited participation, and a secretariat or an administrative body. And uh, as, a, as an example, I gave League of Nations and the United Nations. The League of Nations, of course, no, came about after the First World War, while the United, Sna United Nations arose as a result of the Second World War, where states uh, and nations uh, agreed no, to work together towards a, a goal of uh, peace and and uh, understanding among among nations so that wars like the first world war and the second world war would not happen again as with states international organizations can possess international personality but while every state possesses full personality, international organizations only possess personality granted in either their constituent treaty or arising by necessary implication from their functions. So in other words, the international personality of international organizations is limited. Limited by uh, what is granted to it by, their, by the treaty that created it, or by necessary implication from its functions. Then we have non-governmental organizations. These NGOs or non-governmental organizations are entities created under national law with voluntary private membership to pursue a particular cause that may transcend national borders. And some examples of non-government organizations that have a, uh, a particular international personality are the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. Why are these organizations now granted personality? Because their functions necessarily transcends boundaries. Their cause no? uh, transcends national boundaries. For example, the ICRC, the International Committee of, on the Red Cross, we see that uh, there are national uh, Red Cross organizations or the Red Crescent organizations in in uh, in each particular country they have their own organization which is an umbrella of the under the umbrella of the International Committee of the Red Cross so it's the extent of the influence or the extent of of the cause of the ICRC extends over and across boundaries and for this reason no um, it is given a a standing in the international community then we come now to the individual as subjects of international law previously 
individuals were only considered as objects of international law and they can only access the international community through its representative either a state or a an international agency no in order to uh, make demands upon the international community it has been said that the debate over the position of the individual in international law goes goes to the heart of legal philosophy because if you look at it individuals are actually the basic elements of states therefore uh, the individual no, is actually a, a component of the state and therefore it cannot be disregarded as a subject because ultimately whatever the understanding is between nations or between states affects the individual that is one argument for, with that there are certain related concepts that we should consider in thinking of whether an individual can be the subject of international law now international law actually imposes duties to the individuals no? particularly in criminal responsibility we have uh, there have been cases that have been filed in the international criminal court of justice pertaining to uh, acts of genocide okay crimes against humanity committed by individuals so therefore no individuals in that particular situation okay like dictators and despots who have been charged of these particular offenses or crimes are necessarily subjects of international law and there are of course the consideration of the international rights of individuals the international community recognizes that each individual has a right particularly human rights basic human rights and therefore because it recognizes that the individual has rights then no there is a certain recognition to uh, the personality of an individual in the international community the international community also have acted no in in uh, situations where groups or individuals are in need of of uh, protection from the international community like the situations of of corporations are also subjects of international law but uh, not all corporations are subjects of international law. it is dependent upon the status of such corporation the economic power of many multinational corporations has come to eclipse that of some smaller states and some corp multinational corporations are even richer than some states now this ability of the corporation no to make significant difference to the economies of developing states means that the economic power often entails political power that is it has a sufficient leverage to effect political change in a particular state so the ability of these multinational corporations to affect and to uh, The international personality of corporations derives from two sources. First, the states have concluded treaties among themselves, which gives corporations the ability to bring claims in international fora. So uh, it means that states you know, have agreed you not know, to recognize certain corporations and that these particular corporations may be allowed to bring the redress in the international forums secondly the corporations have been ever active in protecting their overseas interests by concluding long-term 
concession contracts with foreign governments for the construction and exploitation of mines, oil wells, and other resources. These are a fusion of treaty and domestic commercial contracts in that they may be subject to international law. There are some other non-state actors. We have insurgents, terrorists, and national liberation movements. They are given uh, international personality because necessarily these insurgents and national liberation movements cannot be represented by the state where they are located because they are the enemies of that state. They are the oppositors of the state. So how can we give voice to these insurgents and national liberation movements? They are given, of course, a forum in the international community. And as such, they, they enjoy a certain kind of, of legal personality and international personality. And we have, of course, the Vatican, an example, the Holy See. The Vatican or the Holy See or the representative of the Roman Catholic Church cannot, the, the influence of such, of such uh, authority cannot be understated. The Roman Catholic Church have been in existence for several millennia and its influence cannot be denied. Okay. And that's why uh, in this particular situation, the Holy See, the Vatican, is recognized as one having international personality because it can influence uh, uh, relationships in the international community. So we reach the end of the slide. These are our references for our discussion. I hope to see you again in our succeeding discussions and lectures on public international law and the Philippine Constitution. Thank you. And thank you for listening.